I parked in the tower's lot, letting my headlights bore into the amalgam of twisted metal and glass for a few moments before shutting them off. Josh muttered, his voice low. We're really doing this, huh? He ran a hand through his mop of curly hair. A dumb tick he developed last summer when his girlfriend, Annabeth, told him that he was sexy. She was beside him now, cuddled up in the back seat across his lap. I glanced at my own girlfriend, Ellie, in the passenger seat. She was trying her best to appear brave, but I knew better. There was no way she was comfortable with trespassing tonight. I sighed, realizing that Josh would also chicken out. We're doing this. You sure you want to come? I prodded. Josh shifted in his seat, hand running through his hair yet again. Maybe it's better if I stay in the truck. Annabeth shrugged next to him unsurprised. Me too. Ellie chimed in, nodding at Josh. Annabeth met my eyes, a glimmer of understanding passing between us. Our partners were both boring, god-awful goody-two-shoes. Babies, I jabbed, swinging open my door without giving them a moment to respond. Annabeth hopped out behind me, waving at the two losers in the truck before spinning towards me with a grin on her face. They're weird, she said, rolling her eyes. For a moment, I was drinking in the way that her golden hair shimmered in the moonlight. A light breeze tickled at our faces, sending sparkles of her moonlit hair between us. Yup, I mustered. I turned, strolling towards the chain-link fence that formed a circular perimeter around the base of Sabe's Tower. Sabe's Tower, 13 stories of abandoned potential. Whispering of times past when our town's inhabitants thought that we would hit a population boom, becoming the Houston of West Virginia. In the 70s, our success was tied to coal. Jobs flooded in and with them, a myriad of people trying to make their way in life. And then the mines abruptly ran dry, decimating our town's economy. Since that time, our population has done nothing but dwindle. Saves Tower, 13 stories of decaying grandeur, silently rotting from the inside out. Some say that's what happened to Save himself. A rot took hold in his core, spreading and spreading until nothing but rot was left. In the end, he took his own life, which some say was for the best. He was a greedy fool, the wealthiest man for miles owning half the surrounding countryside before the mining industry took off. Made a fortune selling his family's land to coal companies, putting every ounce of profit into making his towering hotel more luxurious than the Ritz-Carlton. Saves Tower, 13 stories of failed dreams, and now screaming vulgar obscenities at her eyes. It is a truly ugly behemoth, domineering our town skyline with unmerited arrogance. Save thought painting the Tower of Purple would give it an air of majesty, like royalties of the past, swaddled in silky lavender robes. His aspiration, after all, was nothing less than to emulate the sacred tabernacle of Moses, to make his hotel a dwelling place for gods among men. In its current state of disrepair, however, the Tower was no more than an eyesore, a visual cacophony of broken glass, peeling sickly purple paint, and rusted steel inlays. Adding to the hotel's disgrace, it was cylindrical in form, perched atop the highest peak for miles, jutting into the sky like a middle finger to the gods. Its phallic outline stood in stark contrast to the rundown strip malls lying in its wake. The fence surrounding the tower was a bit too tall and a bit too wobbly to safely scale, so we circled looking for an entry point. Every few yards, a do not trespass sign hung, tied to the fence with zip ties in each corner. Somebody had taken the liberty to spray paint a word underneath each sign, now making them all read. 
Do not trespass alone. Good thing you're coming with me. I joked, pointing at one of the signs. Annabeth paused to read it for a moment. Yeah, it's kind of weird that somebody did that. I wonder why. I shrugged, continuing around the perimeter. Eventually, we found a gate in the fence, held closed with chains at waist level. The gate's post careened steeply outward, creating a manageable gap near the top. The gate post was only held in place by the chains, not even slightly anchored to the ground. Without too much of a struggle, we hoisted ourselves up and through the gap. Once inside the fence, I found myself spellbound by the abandoned hotel. The stars in the night sky reflected across the windows, bending and warping around the curved perimeter. Each glimmer of starlight turned into dizzying fractals, melting together and slipping between the shards of broken glass with each shift of my gaze. The result was honestly breathtaking. At night, the icerific tower was beautiful. Its silhouette dared to embrace the star-studded cosmos, standing with a quiet dignity that defied its daytime mockery. I felt Annabeth shuffle beside me. Suddenly, her phone flashlight was on, illuminating a path through overgrown concrete to the tower. At the end of the path was the structure's entrance, a gaping hole with no attempt to conceal the darkness within. What the heck are you doing? I yelled, spinning to face her. What? What do you mean? She stuttered. Turn that off, you idiot. I explained, lowering my voice. Somebody might see the light and call the cops. The light flicked off, Annabeth mumbling apologies. I blinked away at the afterimage of weeds eating through the concrete lot, silently cursing myself for being so ridiculously hostile toward her. Sorry, I mumbled. You're good, Donovan, she whispered, brushing her hand across my arm. As we continued to the open doorway, the outside of the tower came into focus. It was far further dilapidated than I had realized, each accent of purple paint Faded and peeling was bulging out from between the glass and steel, like it was trying to escape. I rubbed a fingernail on the paint, revealing a soft, rotting wood beneath. I entered the tower first, pausing to let my eyes adjust. The darkness of the doorway opened up into an atrium that must have once made for a magnificent entrance. It was shaped like a slice of pie, us standing near the crust, peering inward toward the center. Above was pitch black, not yielding any answers to just how high up this mighty room's ceiling stretched. The musty scent that filled my nose was surprisingly welcoming, somewhere between the smell of fishing trips and century-old bookstores. I took a deep breath, relishing in the soft stench. I could vaguely make out wires dangling down from the ceiling of the atrium. They were impossibly long, stretching upward into the infinite gloom. They look like vines, Annabeth whispered, her voice a soft purr. The air was thick with falling dust, filtering down from the abyss above, twirling between the wires in satisfying slow motion. The falling dust made it even harder to see in the dark, leaving the walls on either side of the room foggy blobs. I waved my hand, sending fleeting dust spirals through the air. I remember seeing photos of the atrium online, taken on some of the earliest digital cameras ever made. Those pictures showed marble countertops, intricate wooden carvings, and lushly carpeted floors. The room as it stands today is a barren husk of Save's vision. The carpet, only present in scattered clumps, was impossibly dark, soiled to the point of true black. It clung to the concrete foundation, viciously holding on for dear life in a losing battle. I bent down to examine a clump of carpet in front of me, 
amazed by the absence of light reflecting back. It was like staring into a pit of nothing. A vague absence, an outline of something that should be there. I poked the toe of my boot at it. It exploded, erupting into my face. I gagged instinctively, tasting the vile substance mix into my lungs. Annabeth slapped my back as I continued gagging and coughing, begging the mucus to tear itself free from my lungs and just get out of my body because it feels like I'm dying. Oh God. And eventually it did. The violent hacking subsided into slight retching, and then it was gone. Are you okay? Annabeth tested. Do you think I'm okay? What the heck was that? I spewed. She bent over the clump of carpet. Underneath, the blackened top layer that just violently erupted was a pale network of matted spiderwebs. Hmm, she began. It kind of looks like mycelium. She met my raised eyebrow with an eye roll. You know, like the roots of a fungus or something, I don't know. I just saw the shrooms growing in Bryce's closet that one time he showed me a stash. This white stuff looks just like it. So, I guess that makes this black stuff like the part of the shroom we eat, or whatever. Oh, dip. I responded, nodding. That makes sense. One time I saw a nature show about some plants that shoot their seeds everywhere when something touches them. It's probably just spreading its spores when we touched it. Yeah, she breathed. Pretty gnarly. We shuffled deeper into the gloom, weaving between dangling cables and clumps of fungus. I felt a drop of moisture flick off a cable sliding onto my arm. I groaned. Crap, the cable was wet. A disgusting, she whispered back. We made our way to the apex of the room, the center of the tower, revealing a rusted set of elevator doors leaning together like a drunk set of quinceanera. The doorway to the stairs, however, beckoned us with the same unobstructed, pitch black allure that the tower's entrance emanated just minutes before. In the dark, it's truly amazing how utterly void all open doorways look. Upon stepping inside the stairwell, the world vanished. The only proof of having working eyes was a faint, vertical glow of light filtering through the door, abruptly fading into an all-consuming black. Every sound in the entire building bored through my soul, bouncing from wall to wall, ceiling to floor, echoing on and on for all of eternity. The stairwell directly in the center of the decrepit hotel was the focal point of every creaking floorboard every popping nail and every howling gust of wind. It was as if I was holding up a monstrous a conch shell to my ear, a deafening murmur of echoes and disarray, smelting together to form satanic harmonies. Whoa, Annabeth mumbled. Her word cut through the other echoes and possibly loud against their monotonous hum. Instantly, the echo of her voice filled the stairwell, rising like the build up of a dubstep song until peaking, and possibly overwhelming for a few brief seconds. The echoes of her voice then faded as quickly as they had arrived. She put a hand to her mouth, the whites of her eyes barely visible in the glow coming from the doorway. I reached out, placing a hand where her shoulder should be. There wasn't enough space for us to stand abreast in the stairwell, leaving us in a comically squished proximity. She was breathing rapidly, barely managing to stay silent. I squeezed and her breathing quickly slowed. I felt her hand creep onto mine and we stood for a minute, simply listening to the cries of the dying building echo around us. As my eyes adjusted, I could make out a staircase spiraling up the curved wall. Clearly, this was a service stairwell as it is too much cramped for the likes of Saves Gas. Only a few steps were visible through the darkness at the time, making the staircase feel even tinier than it already was. Luckily, no fungus grew on the stairs themselves, leaving the metal alone to rust. Annabeth shuffled onto the first step, producing a small object from her pocket. 
She handed it to me and then pointed up the stairwell, careful to not send echoes through the cylindrical chamber again. I brought it close to my eyes for inspection, straining against the lack of light. A joint. She wants to go to the roof and smoke. A smile cracked my lips. Classic Annabeth. Every couple stair steps there would be a doorway. Most of them let in a dim glow, offering a glimpse into what must have once been a custodial closet on each floor. On floor 9, I tugged at Annabeth's hand. We made eye contact in the faint light coming from the doorway. I motioned through it, pointing to the nearby fungus-free floor. I wanted to explore at least a little bit, to see if the closet circled around the stairwell or not. I poked my head through the doorway, freeing myself from the overwhelming cacophony of echoes in the stairwell. I verified that the closet did in fact curve around the circular staircase like a donut. A few steps in one direction led to a terrifying drop, the elevator shaft. Next to it, a sidewalk-sized ledge led to an open door, giving a view of the floor's main hallway. The path looked safe, no fungus cracks or otherwise obvious defects, so I proceeded, trading as light as a fox fumbling for Annabeth's hand behind me. The main hallway ran between the custodial closet and the guest room, creating another donut ring around the central stairwell. Throughout the hallway, patches of fungus grew, alarmingly close together, threatening to overtake the concrete. That stairwell was insane, Annabeth whispered. I nodded. Yeah, I wonder what it was like when the hotel was actually open had to have been miserable for the staff. We weaved through the fungus-filled hallway, coming to room 901. I glanced at Annabeth, raising my eyebrows. The door was slightly ajar, hanging from its one remaining door hinge. I pushed gently, eliciting a monstrous creak. The room was empty, extending away to the outside in a familiar pie shape. The mold seemed to grow thinner in the room, leaving most of the exposed concrete safe to cross. At the far side, a floor-to-ceiling panel of windows looked out over our town. I gasped, taken in the view. Never before had I seen our town from this high up. My eyes drew to the smokestacks by the river, their blinking lights ominously flickering over downtown. Individual streets ran in parallel lines away from the tower, lit with yellowing streetlights. Between the roads, tiny lights cast from window panes twinkled, blending with one another into a starscape of their own. Dude, I said, look at this. No response. I spun, looking for Annabeth, frantically scanning the room. My eyes had adjusted to the outside light, leaving me sightless. Annabeth, I hissed. The cold tingle went up my spine, pulling at the hairs on the back of my neck. Annabeth. Silence. I crept back across the floor, now aware of the entire room at once. There was nowhere for her to be hiding. No desks, cans of paint, ladders, nothing. Just an empty room with patchy fungus growing on the cement. Something must have happened. I studied each fungal growth in the room as I passed by. Even with the light cast from the windows, the tops remained impossibly dark. Not a single feature was discernible. Only an outline was visible. Halfway to the door, a three-foot wide hole led straight to floor eight. I could have sworn that it wasn't there before. I peered into the opening, seeing straight through to the room below. From what I could see, it was identically empty. Annabeth, I tried again, nearing the door to the hallway. Boo! I stumbled backward, tripping over my own feet. I landed squarely on a patch of fungus. It exploded instantly. But I remembered to hold my breath, close my eyes, and plug my nose this time. Annabeth cackled from the threshold of the doorway, standing over me with both hands on her forehead. You should have seen the luck. She began, breaking off into another fit of laughter. 
Shut up, I groaned, pushing to my feet. My entire body was covered in squishy fungus gunk. I pointed at the hole behind me, continuing. You could have killed me. Blah, 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 she mocked. You're fine, you're just being a baby. Annabeth gave me a playful shove, hands lingering for a moment overdue. Swatting her paws off me, I marched back to the stairwell. I led the rest of the way to floor 13, followed by her snickers. As I reached the top of the stairs and stepped onto the 13th floor, my jaw dropped. It was a scene straight out of a surrealist painting. An enormous pool room lay before us. Glass walls extended up from the tile floors, creating a massive, clear domed perimeter. A swath of stars twinkled brilliantly through the clear ceiling, their light refracting through the glass, casting ethereal patterns onto the room's otherwise oblique surroundings. The pool itself was a semicircular cutout, covering half of the floor space, starting at ground level then deepening into a corkscrew motion. Its ceramic tiles, once probably a bright blue, were now tinged with patches of the same fungal growth that we had come across on the lower floors. The growth was sparse here though, letting the original floor design take prominence. In the center of the room on top of the staircase we just stepped off of, stood a circular pillar that extended up to the middle of the glass dome, like a spine holding up the entire tower. A small antenna jetted out from above the pillar atop the dome. Surrounding the antenna was a low fence, perhaps a safety measure for maintenance workers. Annabeth, having finally contained her laughter, stepped beside me, her face illuminated by the soft starlight filtering in through the dome. She too stood silent, taken back by the unexpected beauty of this forgotten space. As we moved around the room, our steps echoed across the vast emptiness. With every patch of fungus that we passed, the same eerie darkness hovered, the undulating mold standing stark against the ceramic tiles. We made our way back to the central pillar, a ladder carved into the pillar connected to the glass ceiling with a trap door. To the roof, Annabeth sat, rubbing her hands together in a goblin-like motion. Ladies first. As she climbed above me, I couldn't help but crane my neck and drool. She slammed open the trap door and we burst through to the roof. The fenced-in area was covered with a dark and spongy surface, gripping at my knees when I stood up. Wind whipped around us, carrying a chill that cut through my clothes and bit into my skin. With each gust, the antenna above us groaned and swayed, almost as if we were joining in a dance with an unseen partner. We sat on the squishy rubber surface, comfortably in silence. I met her eyes, smiling dumbly. We passed the joint back and forth until it dwindled down its ember glow flickering one last time before extinguishing completely. A familiar haze crawled through my thoughts, slowing the passage of time to a languishing crawl. Hey, she started. I think I've finally found inspiration for my next album. I scooted closer to her, taking her hand. I knew the topic brought about an unusual timidity in her. A blemish in her tough persona that she's so keen on presenting. She won't even talk to her own boyfriend about a music career. Yeah, I floated. She hesitated for a second, settling into the moment. I felt a tug at my crotch, suddenly all too aware of how pretty she looked in the moonlight. I took in every detail. The way that her hair fell across her face. The pattern of her freckles. The soft speckling of stars reflecting across her eyes. I think you need to take off your shirt though first, she whispered, now inches from my face. You're filthy. I glanced down, remembering the fungal gunk that had soiled my clothes when she had scared me. Without warning, her hands slid under my shirt, warm and sure. I helped her yank it off, collapsing into her lips. When we got back to the truck, I was still high enough to see everything in slow motion. Before pulling out of the parking lot, Annabeth and I regurgitated the events of our urban exploration, 
trying to show our significant others what fun they had missed out on. It goes without saying that part of the story was intentionally omitted. Ellie and Josh were unamused. Their lack of adventure will forever be a mystery to me. We swung out of the lot, hopping onto the highway headed into town. I swayed between lanes, struggling to keep the double yellow lines in focus. Now, are you sure you're good to drive? Ellie asked, gripping the armrest. I'm fine, I slurred. Seconds later, another truck materialized in front of us. I swerved to avoid it, and then everything went black. I woke up to a strong hand pulling me out of the window. My truck was upside down, the roof completely caved in. I groaned. Oh, come on. The person who pulled me out looked like the kind of guy who chewed tobacco and spit wisdom. His fishing cap cast a deep shadow across his eyes in the moon's glow, concealing his gaze. He was an old timer, that's for sure. One of those folk came during the coal rush and decided to stay when all was said and done. I could see his truck, the same truck that I saw moments before the crash, pulled into the shoulder of the highway with its blinkers on. Hey, easy now, he reassured, his voice like gravel under a boot. Anybody else inside? I nodded, unable to speak. I plopped onto the grassy slope, embarking off the side of the road. The old man pulled their mangled bodies out one by one. The countryside shrank around me. I felt the corners of my vision pulling in, the weed in my system straining the limits of shock that I could take before melting down. I'm sorry, son, he whispered, his voice carrying the weight of my guilt. The police will be here soon. Don't you worry. The police. I stood up. I knew exactly how the police treated people with my skin color in this town. I ran. Hey now, the man hollered. I kept running. Away from the truck, away from my dead friends, away from the police. I ran until my breath came in ragged, uncontrollable huffs. I flopped to the ground, laying on the cool concrete, cradling my head with my hands. Blood flowed between my fingertips, pooling onto the pavement. I laid there until police sirens wailed through the night, rapidly approaching. They stopped at the rack, leaving me in silence. Moments later, the sirens picked up their mournful song again heading toward me. I sat up. I was back in the lot of Sabes Tower. Only then did I realize how little distance I really ran from the rack. A couple hundred yards at most. Four or five, maybe even six sirens filled the air. They were all coming for me. They knew what I had done. I bolted from my position on the concrete. I could hide in the tower. No way the cops would look for me in that rotting place. They wouldn't dare. I squeezed through the gap in the fence, same as before, vaulting past the Do Not Trespass Alone signs in a fluid lunge. The sirens behind me screamed into the night, melting together into a continuous doomsday chant. Red and blue lights filled the lot. I hit the ground right in front of the gaping entrance to the tower praying that the weeds poking through the concrete would be enough to mask my form. I army crawled inch by inch, dragging myself along broken bottles and plywood shrapnel until I was safely in the darkness of the tower. In, out, I breathed. A police cruiser parked in the lot. Its siren drowned out all of their wails for a moment before shutting off. A chubby white officer hopped out surveying the scene. His gaze came to rest in the spot where I had lain. He squatted down, raking a finger through the pool of blood that I left behind. He took a few steps toward the tower, squatting down yet again. Another splotch of blood, no doubt. His voice floated through the plaza, slightly nasally and a little out of breath. In dispatch, this is Officer Chetty, badge number 741. I'm on the scene at 1019 Pleasant Valley Lane, in the lot of Saves Tower. 
I've located a pool of fresh blood that may be linked to our hit and run suspect. Possible injury, a suspect could be close. Requesting immediate backup and forensics for evidence collection. I worm my way further into the tower's belly, sliding between patches of fungus like a mouse in a snake pit, heading for the stairwell. I had to ascend to find some nook or cranny out of reach of the pursuing officers. The godforsaken tower was one big game of hide and seek, only this time losing meant far worse than a bruised ego. Something gurgled in the darkness. My blood froze. I halted, my heart hammering a tattoo against my ribs. Holding my breath, I strained my senses, eyes peering into the graying murk, searching for the source of the sound. It came again, a wretched retching, like an animal choking on its own vomit. Hacking, gurgling, bubbling wetness, bursting through strained vocal cords, a sound of fading vitality. It was coming from near the door just outside the meager halo of light slipping through the hole. A wet line smeared across the back of my neck. A yelp escaped my lips before I realized it was just a cord dangling from the ceiling. At my yelp, the gurgling paused. A heavy hush fell over the place, the quietude of the hunted. I could faintly make out echoes emanating from the stairwell, only a few feet behind me. The gurgling continued, sucking at the thick air. It began to drag itself forward through the fungus-covered floor, a slow, steady rhythmic drag against the concrete. A geyser of spores bloomed, mingling with swirls of dust in the meager light. The creature, or whatever it was, did not slow its approach. Out of the darkness, a form began to shape, a silhouette clawing its way toward me. I could see this eruption envelop the mass on the floor. One hand appeared and then another, its fingers scrabbled over the concrete, searching for any purchase to grip. They flexed, heaving the thing even closer. A mop of curly hair appeared between the hands, a body face down. It pulled itself closer into another fungal growth, grinding its face through the rough concrete. A knife protruded from its back. The handle jutted upward, a grim totem amidst the grime. I shuddered, involuntarily taking a step closer to the stairwell. It looked up at me, or rather, Josh looked up at me. I stared back, mouth agape. His face was nearly sanded off from the concrete. His nose took the worst of it, ground down to the bone, leaving only two sucking, gurgling holes between his eyes. His cheeks were a mangled mess of blood and rock, viscous red flowing freely from the tip of his chin before dribbling off. The chunks of meat hanging where lips should have been, flapped against his teeth with every jerky motion tethered to his face by all two little strands of flesh. Beneath them, his teeth showed bright red and white in a perpetual, grimacing smile. Josh? I managed to whisper in my voice a frightened squeak. Josh opened his mouth as if to respond, ripping both cheeks in half. He hacked, gurgling, spitting up blood that came from deep within his torso. He slowly cocked his head to the side, but instead of stopping at a slant, he kept twisting his neck until bones started to crack and his head dangled upside down. His mangled, upside down head swung limply as he pulled himself to his knees, his neck like jelly. He wasn't wearing the same clothes that he was wearing earlier tonight. No, he was wearing clothes from the night Annabeth first cheated on him with me. He was at a Villanova game supporting his favorite team since birth. Annabeth knew that he would be gone for the weekend, so we took our chance. I was still at her place when he came back, wearing his Colin Gillespie jersey and reeking a beer. Now in front of me, his prized jersey was in tatters, torn to ribbons by the concrete. He groaned, shuffling and reaching for me with bloody fingers. I bolted into the stairwell, taking the steps two at a time. I pushed myself faster and faster until the door to floor 9 loomed to my side. 
I didn't pause for a moment, pushed forward by the gurgling echoes reverberating from below. My thighs weak from the frantic climb begged for a break. I wobbled into the hallway, painfully tiptoeing through the fungus. The door to 901 beckoned ahead, hanging open like it had been awaiting my hasty return. I stumbled over the threshold when Annabeth's singing filled the room. Oh, Donovan. I froze. Outlined against the window was a two-headed beast. One face belonged to Annabeth, the other to Ellie. The creature swayed an obscene dance of bear-infused flesh. It wore no clothes, as if to mock God himself. It had two sets of everything, eight appendages in total, like a humanoid arachnid. Annabeth's breasts, now side by side with Ellie's, put Ellie to shame even now. Annabeth crooned again. Oh, Donovan, each syllable laced with acid and honey. The sound made my skin crawl as it floated through the silent room. You always did want more, didn't you, Donovan? Ellie sneered, a harsh grin splitting her face. Annabeth spat. More than Ellie could give, more than anybody could give. The thing dropped to the floor with a thud. All eight limbs moved in unison as it crawled. Isn't this what you wanted at both of us at the same time? Their voices tumbled over each other, moving in synchrony. Together, their laughter filled the hollow room. Don't you like the thrill, Donovan? Don't you like playing with fire? The thing scurried at me, jumping over fungal girls with powerful leaps. The sudden movement broke my paralyzation, spurring my legs to action. I darted into the closet and through the stairwell door, into the gurgling echoes. Back down the stairwell I ran, the two-headed beast in pursuit. Both girls snarled, hindered by their conjoined size and the narrow passageway. Their struggle echoed through the stairwell, mixing with the gurgling. I fled further down, needing to put distance between that thing and me. I stopped dead in my tracks between floors two and three. Josh was there, leaning against the wall with the knife removed from his back, now grasped tightly in his hand. I staggered back up the stairs, instinctively retreating, narrowly avoiding the blade as he lunged at me. Glancing up, I caught a flash of pale skin bearing down on me, cutting off my escape. My only way out was the door to floor three. I charged through the closet, leaving the echoes behind me. Floor three was empty. No walls, only fungus and windows. The atrium loomed to my left, a pie-shaped hole missing from the floor and ceiling. I backed away from the door, eyeing the dangling cords hanging in the atrium. Maybe, just maybe. Josh stumbled from the stairwell, filling the air with his wet slurping. Annabeth and Ellie followed, scrambling toward me. I didn't have time to think. I jumped, grasping at the dangling wires, praying that they would hold my weight. Time stuttered, hanging suspended like an icicle on a winter's morning. The world spun in a dizzying blur as I twisted, fingers stretching for a grab. Panic clawed its icy fingers up my spine, but it was the surprise that struck me most, the simple disbelief that this was happening. A wire found its way into my hand, snapping without slowing my fall. The wind whooshed past, ripping the breath from my lungs. Above me, the third floor retreated, its grimy concrete replaced by a view of the atrium ceiling, wires swinging back and forth from my desperate escape. And then came the sensation of falling. It's a feeling that strikes a primal chord. An orchestra of fear and adrenaline that means the end of a life. My stomach lurched, free falling alongside me, while the rest of my body seemed to hover in a state of disbelief. The impact came as both a shock and an inevitability. There was a moment of sheer, undiluted pain, a soundless scream reverberating through my very bones. It felt like being shattered from the inside out 
an explosion of agony that started from my back and radiated outwards. An iron-hot spike of pain shot through me, and then a chilling void as everything below my waist slipped into a terrifying numbness. The echo of my body's collision rang in my ears as the world spun into a disorienting world of blurs, shadows, and pain. The cold concrete beneath me felt real, solid, a chilling contrast to the sudden loss of sensation in my legs. In the throbbing silence that followed, I understood. I had fallen. I was broken. I lay sprawled on the atrium floor, gasping, the world tilting dangerously in my vision. Annabeth and Ellie emerged from the staircase, scrambling across the atrium floor. Red and blue police lights filtered through the tower's windows, making shadows dance between the monster's eight limbs. Josh wasn't far behind, still clutching onto the bloody knife, head rolling upside down between his shoulders. Police, we're coming in, a familiar nasally voice shouted. The moment officers stepped a foot into the tower, the monsters vanished in a spray of spores.